Side note before we get uh, started, in two weeks we're starting a new series on the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is this book that is veiled in mystery and people say it's hard to understand. It's actually quite easy to understand um, if, if we're looking at it the right way. And there couldn't be no more timely message than the message in that book. And so we're going to be jumping into that study. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have a number of new groups that are starting. So for those of you who are willing to actually uh, lead a group, it's going to be a six-week study. Uh, your group would meet, I don't know, it could meet all six weeks or it could meet every other week. Um, uh, Lisa and I are going to be down here. Um, we would love to meet you. And we just have like a five-minute meeting to talk about uh, group leadership. We would love for you to be able to do that. If you've been around CCV for a long time and, and you're a Christ follower, we need you during this series. And then we're going to, next week, we're going to roll out sign up. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be um, encouraging and bewildering and powerful all at the same time. I want to start by asking a question. How many of you love scary movies? Raise your hand. Hold your hand up high. I see people shaking their head. What is wrong with you people? Were, were you not held at birth or something like that? In fact, I hate TV. I hate scary TV shows. One of the scariest TV shows comes on after my favorite TV show. My favorite TV show is on 8 o'clock on Friday night on ABC. And what is that? Shark Tank, right? Love Shark Tank. Love it because I'm sitting there. I'm like, no, don't infest. They don't have a clear proposition. They don't, they're, anyway, so, uh, but after this show, if, I, if, if Lisa's still amped up, this show comes on afterwards, and it is the scariest TV show in the world. Is it not? You know it is. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's Christina, where tonight we're talking about, in the scary voice, you know, it comes on. Uh, you know Christina, the, the nice 80-year-old lady that works at Wawa that gives you your coffee? And she knows exactly your order, and you just love her, and she's so sweet. Well, you watch that show, and you realize, oh my goodness, she has 30 people chained in her basement, right? And I'm like, I, don't, I was like, I'm like, Lisa, how do you die? I have PTS, PTSD after this show. I can't go to sleep. Why do you watch this stuff? Well, um, uh, scary movies, actually, too. Um, I, have a, 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 I have a weird thing. I'm scared of clowns, okay? Am I the only one that's... Uh, thank you, clowns. Did you see Stephen King's movie, It? Did you see this movie? This was the clown. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's the worst. You know... But I've seen a, a, a scarier clown. 2007, Christ Church of the Valley. 2007, Easter egg hunt. Someone had the bright idea to get Tom Adams as a friend. He's since moved to Ohio. And they asked Tom Adams to dress up in this Easter bunny suit. Look at this. <laughs> Just look at this. Can you imagine being a four-year-old kid? And then your, your mother leans down, good news, the Easter Bunny is going to sneak into our house tonight and put eggs everywhere, right? Show the picture. Show the picture. Oh, my gosh. Stop this. Stop this. Well, there are a lot of scary things in the world that actually aren't scary. They're not really real. But there are, there are some things that are scary that we don't know that they're scary, and we should be frightened of them. And we're actually going to talk about that today. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments where God was basically given the Cliff Notes version of all of the law that was to come. Just a quick Cliff Notes version. If you, if you, if you nail these ten, you're probably going to have a good chance of hitting the others. And he says this, he says, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, when we read that in, the, in, in 2022, as Americans, as enlightened, educated people, we're like, yeah, of course. We're not going to have any other gods before you. You're our God. We choose you. And God's like, no, 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 that's not what I mean. You don't understand what I mean. I mean, you actually are not allowed to have any other gods before me 
because I mean it, there are actually other gods, like real, live, other gods. And you can't choose them over me. And we read that and we're like, now listen, it's only morons and people that live in a hut in Indonesia that believe that there are other gods in the world. And God is like, no, 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 there are. Now, in the Old Testament, the preferred way to talk about God is to use his actual name. God has a name. God's name is Yahweh, or most commonly, Yahweh God. You hear the phrase in the Bible, the Lord God. Now, why did God like to be called by his name? Wait for it. Because there are many different gods. We have a lot to cover. You're going to find some of it fascinating and some of it terrifying. So hang with me. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for God, in the beginning, God, is the Hebrew word Elohim. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. Now listen, Elohim is a category, not a name. Yahweh is God's name. Elohim is a category. Like my personal name is what? Brian. But I have different categories that I fit into. A lot of people will call me a pastor. I am a husband. I'm a father. Some of you call me sexy beast, which I think is weird. <laughs> Wish you would stop, but you do. You know, so these are categories. Like, and just think of you. What is your personal name? And then what categories are you? You're a dad. You're a father. You're a husband. You um, are a coworker. You have lots of categories that you fit in. But there's a personal name and categories. And Elohim, and I want you to write this down, and Elohim it is, is an invisible but real spiritual creature. God calls them gods. And in the beginning, there was only one Elohim. There was a category of gods, and there was only one of them, and his name was Yahweh. One uncreated God that created all the other gods. So there's this God, the all-powerful, uncreated, eternally existent creator of the universe, who was above all other gods. And then there were other gods, Elohim, invisible but real spiritual creatures. You hanging with me? In the very beginning of the Bible, it says, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. Some interpreters will say that is God talking to the Trinity. Like God the Father turns to Jesus and he's like, bro, what do you want to do? I don't know. Let's make people in my own image. And then the Holy Spirit's like, cool. And then a lot of people think that's the Trinity talking to one another. What other people interpret it as is God is saying to the Elohim, let us make human beings in my image. So there's Yahweh, the one uncreated, all-powerful, all-knowing Elohim. And then there are other Elohims beneath him, other created, invisible, or real spiritual creatures. We see this practically when we go from Genesis to Exodus, where God takes on Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. Remember that story? God raises up Moses, sends him to talk to Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh doesn't listen to him. And so what does God do? He sends plagues. Help me out, what are the plagues? Gnats, boils, frogs, country music. They're terrible, right? One of them is he blots out the sun for three days. I was in uh, Cairo, one of the scariest places I've been in the world, quite frankly. Um, I was in Cairo. Uh, the, the your Arab Spring was in, what, 2014? And then we were there in... 20, 2018, we were there in 2018, we're in Cairo, I go to the Egypt, Egyptian antiquities, I've never been in a museum where you have to enter underneath a bulletproof shield. Like they're literally wheeling this bulletproof shield. So anyway, in the antiquity museum, there is this statue right here. Right here, there it is. This is Amun-Ra. Ra is the sun god. It is the chief God, the chief Elohim for the Egyptians. And by God blotting out the sun for three days, what was he saying? I'm greater than Amun-Ra. 
I am bigger than that. A lot of people will read the story in Exodus about Moses throwing down his staff and then Pharaoh's people come, his magicians come out and do what? They throw down their staff and they turn into snakes too. And then according to the Charlton Heston movie, God's snake eats the other ones. And we were like, oh, that's a nice story. But that actually happened. How did they actually make their, their, their staff turn into snakes? By the power of their Elohim. It actually happened. It says that when he finally delivered the people, God's people from Egypt, Yahweh has brought judgment on their gods. And there's the oldest piece of scripture in the entire Bible. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of historical poetry about what actually happened when God delivered the people. Parting the scene, it's this. It's the oldest piece of scripture. It says this. And then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to Yahweh, for he's highly exalted. Both horse and driver he's hurled into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my defense and has become my salvation. He is my Elohim, and I will praise him. My father's Elohim, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. And at the end of this chapter, it says, Who among the Elohim is like you, Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? And the answer is, there are no Elohim that are like him because he created them all. We continue from Exodus and we go to the Psalm. Psalm 86, 8 says, Among the Elohim there is none like you, Yahweh. No deeds can compare with yours. Psalm 96 says, For great is Yahweh and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared among the Elohim. Worship him, all you Elohim. For you, Yahweh, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted above, far above all other gods. Now we ask ourselves, who in the world believes this kind of stuff? I know that if I was walking into this room and listening to this ugly guy on stage talk about this kind of stuff, I would be like, this is such a, this is so stupid. This is bull crap. This, this, is, this is mythical stuff that people think in northern India. I actually was in Northern India about a decade ago when we started a church planning partnership. Amazing partnership that's going on. There are probably 30 churches now that our partnership has started there. Very backwoods. In this area of India, there are numerous, they, they're banyan trees. They're beautiful banyan trees. And at the base of these trees, what they do is they put figurines. And these figurines represent the different Hindu deities. There are over three million Hindu deities in their pantheon. I remember when I was there, they, they asked me to do a training for pastors, and I was just so, so incredibly humbled. Um, there were pastors that walked over the mountains for five days, and this is in a preserve that has king cobras and lions and elephants. This is a dangerous place. I wouldn't be willing to walk across the street to listen to me, but these guys... I was so humbled by them and they were so hungry because they wanted a Bible of their own and to hear the word, it was just an amazing experience. In this multi-day event that we're there just teaching from sunup till sundown uh, with these great leaders, I had to go to the bathroom. And I said, where can I go to the bathroom? And one of them said, up the hill, they had built this makeshift porta potty behind a tree. And I said, I can't see it, and I don't want to get eat, or I don't want to get bit by a king cobra. Can you walk me up there? And, and they were like, "No, no, 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 no. We're not going to go there. We're no, no, no. We're not going there." And 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 I was like, "Why?" They were like, "Because there is a spirit that lives in that tree." And I'm like, "There's a spirit that lives in the tree." I'm like, "I tell you what." I got good news and bad news. The good news for you is I got to go to the bathroom. The bad news for that spirit is I'm going to pee all over that tree. I'm going to do it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
I pee on this tree and it's up there. I was thinking of all the funny things I was gonna do to this tree and the, and the stupid spirit that lives in the tree. And I went to pee behind the tree and I felt a force of evil I had never felt before. Now, it could have been confirmation bias, right? You expect that there's gonna be something there. You go there, you feel something, so you assume that it's that. Uh, of course it could have been that. But there was something there. There is a reason when Yahweh said, do not put these gods before me and do not create figurines as portals for these gods to connect with you. There's a reason he said that. And we're like, oh, that's no big deal. Listen, those figurines that you have of statues on your dashboard, you need to rip them off of your dashboards and throw them in the trash. Those of you who have statues buried in your yard, you need to dig them up and throw them in the trash. Now, I know some of you are sort of like Anna Kendrick there that you're like, you've never heard this, and you're like, uh, what? I've never heard this in Sunday school class. And here's what you need to understand. Some Christians will say this is polytheism. No. Polytheism is the worship of many gods. What the Bible is teaching here is the existence of many gods. Paul said, indeed, there are many gods and many lords, yet for us... There is but one God, Yahweh, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Now, as you read through scripture, starting with Genesis all the way to Revelation, these Elohim go by different names. Gods, heavenly beings, sons of God sons of the most high, demons, Bill Belichick, cheer, sorry. The, I didn't see the game, that, uh, anyway, do, do they play today or did they play yesterday? Who cares, no one's watching anyway. So, princes, lords, powers, principalities, rulers, authority, spiritual forces of evil, powers of the dark world, evil spirits. Basically, when we're talking about gods, it's the Old Testament's way of referring to demons. Now, some of you are thinking, well, why didn't you just say that at the beginning? And I just want to say, what fun would that be? If there was but one demon, it would be a being so powerful that it would be worshipped as a god on this earth. The ability to change nature to inflict pain, to change the course of human events. That is a God, and that ought to tell you how powerful our God is that created spiritual beings like that. He's more powerful than all of them combined. We're starting to, uh, just a quick series, just two weeks, uh, a series called What is the Bible Exactly? And so I want to ask, answer the question, you know, why in the world are we talking about these Elohim, these gods? Here's a passage I want those of you who are in groups, those of you who are in disciple and relationships, I want you to go and have a conversation about Psalm 82. Psalm 82 says, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the Elohim. So the picture here is Psalm 82. God is there in the throne room, and you read in the book of Job, Satan is able to come into the presence of God. This is not a physical realm, what we can see, taste, touch, hear, and smell. God and we ultimately will exist in a realm that is not bound by space and time. As a reminder, we are spiritual beings that live in physical bodies. We are not our physical bodies. Some of you have a cancer diagnosis, and it, you, you can't help but think you are dying. No, 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 no. You're not dying. Your body's dying. You're a spiritual being that's living in a physical body. So God's having this conversation with the, the Elohim, the good 
angels if you want to call them, and not the demons. And he says, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Now notice he's not talking to human beings, he's talking to the Elohim, to the, to the, to the evil demons. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. He's saying to these forces of darkness, and what we need to understand, and this is probably going to help a lot of you who are going through a really difficult season right now. A lot of people wrestle with the question, why would God allow evil to exist in the world? Why would this wonderful person or you, why would you, after all of you've done to help people in the way that you love God, why would God allow this to happen to you, to your child, to someone that you love? And what we have to understand is there are three wills in the, in the universe. There's our will, what we want to see happen. There's Yahweh's will, what he wants to see happen. And then there is their will, the powers of darkness. And all three of these are operational. And so a lot of people end up blaming God for something that the Elohim are doing. Now, why do we have the Bible? I want you to go, Kina, can you go to the very last point, number three? Why do we have Elohim? It's, or why do we have the Bible? It's this. When you meet a Christian who tells you it's okay to disobey a clear command in Scripture, that person is serving as a mouthpiece for an Elohim opposed to God. I told you before how much I hate social media and I love it I actually enjoy social media and I hate it it's sort of like the Phillies you know what I'm saying like I, I love it and hate it at the same time uh, it doesn't really live up to expectations but um, found out recently that a friend of mine is going through a divorce and his wife had cheated on him have young kids in elementary school his wife is leaving them for someone else. I want you to imagine with me his wife working out at the gym with a friend, and then afterwards, the two of them, and her friend's a Christian, go to a bar for drinks. Nothing wrong with getting a drink. I'm not a drinker, but there's nothing wrong if you want to go get a drink. She's unhappy. Understand that there's a word for unhappiness in the Bible. It's called life. Anyway, she's unhappy. She's talking to her Christian friend. They're sitting in a bar. They're having a drink. While they're at the bar, her Christian friend leans over and says, you know you don't have to stay with them, right? I know you're unhappy. Because the whole point of marriage is to be happy, right? So, you know it's okay to to leave them. Just start over. Your kids will be okay. My question is, where is that coming from? Is that just one human being talking to another? Psalm 82 says, the foundations of the earth were shaking. When you were in fourth grade and one of your parents decided this marriage is done, when, Christian, when, when a Christian tells you it's no big deal, just leave them, you need to be happy, you understand where that's coming from. Now, we're not talking about a marriage where someone is actually being hurt. Like some of you have been in those relationships where you needed to leave that person. In fact, you'll probably joke, that person was a demon, right? Like you need to have boundaries. And the, and the Bible gives you that permission that in cases of porneia, it says you cannot divorce someone in, except for issues of porneia. Porneia is the Greek word that is a blanket term for all kinds of wickedness. Use, cheating, harming you emotionally. There are some relationships you need to get out of and God is cheering for you. But the vast majority of relationships that people are in 
are just difficult because, shocker, relationships are difficult. They're hard. Goodness, when we get married, we don't even know who we are. We change and we evolve and we're constantly discovering. So that's why for people who have gone through a divorce, dang it, you better have an extreme amount of grace for them. Because but yet for the grace of God, there, there go I, right? But for a Christian to be purposely telling another Christian that you don't have to obey God's command to stick in there and fight for that marriage until the end, that is not something that they just came up with on their own. First, Paul says this, such teachings have come through hypocritical liars. They've become the mouthpiece for what? An Elohim that is seeking to destroy people's lives. Many of us have taken the advice from a Christian or a non-Christian in that we've lived out the advice and we've regretted the consequences of that. And lo, lo and behold, we realize in the Bible that we never should have done that. That is not an accident. So the reason, and so we're talking about this series, the Bible. Why do we have the Bible? Why do we have this guidebook to help us through life? It's because there are so many voices in our culture giving us really bad advice. We need it as human beings, one place to go to and say, that's what God thinks on this matter so we can live it out. I was at my daughter's wedding. Um, uh, they're living in California. And so uh, it, was in, it was in California. It was really cool. While you were here and I looked on the weather channel and 10 degree weather with snow, I myself was suffering in Southern California in 70 degree weather. So I just want you to know that I, <laughs> I felt pretty great. So <laughs> while we were there, we we're in the hotel room and we we're just getting ready. We're flipping through channels and Ellen was on and it's her last season. So evidently she's saying whatever she thinks. And she had someone on that she was interviewing about reincarnation and about how we have these past lives and, and about how we, we can feel the pain from these past lives. And for, and for some of you that are terrible human beings, you're gonna come back as a toad, right? And then for some of you who are good that are going through bad situations, you're gonna come back as a princess, and all this kind of stuff, right? And I'm thinking, what <laughs> world is she talking about? Who comes up with this stupid stuff? hypocritical liars who have Elohim speaking through them. And so whether it's Ellen, your grandma, or your best friend, we have to go back to what does scripture say about how we're to believe and how we're to live. It's the final authority. So what is the Bible? The Bible is a book written for people who have been rescued from the power of the Elohim, opposed to Yahweh, and it provides specific instructions for how to love Yahweh and how to love each other. Let's keep digging into that book. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you so much that even when we think we're crazy because we believe this kind of stuff, we're not. Like, how can we believe, not believe this stuff, but we believe that what the Bible talks about, eternal life and love and how God loves us if we're not willing to accept and believe this. We thank you so much that we are not powerless against the Elohim. We are not powerless against the principalities of darkness that you give us because of your spirit authority over them. You give us your power greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We thank you for what you have done for us in Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.